I recently graduated at the top of my class for my Master of Education program at Monash University, which is one of the top ranked universities in the world. And in this video, I'm gonna be sharing with you four kind of uncommon things that I did that allowed me to place first. And at the end of this video, I'm also gonna be sharing with you one thing that I didn't do that I see a lot of people doing that would have made all four of those things basically useless. So stay tuned to find out. By the way, if you are wondering where I am, this is not a swanky new office. I wish I had a swanky new office that looked like this, but actually this is just the Airbnb that we're staying at. I'm in LA right now. Final day of my US tour, I'm meeting up with a bunch of students. It's been a good time. Heading to Singapore next, but I'm ready to go back home. Okay, so before we start a little bit of context, the program I did was the Master of Education in General Educational Studies. And going into it, I set myself a goal. I wanted to be able to complete the program and get very good results while spending significantly less time than normal uh, and other people would spend on studying because, you know, I've got a channel, <laughs> I've got a reputation, I guess, to try to prove. I wanted to show my methods in action. And actually, I already created videos on some of those methods, which you can check out. Those videos do tell you how I studied for it, and it's an accurate depiction of the way that I studied all my material. By the end of the year, I won the Dean's Award for Academic Excellence, which is given to the top graduating student of the cohort. My work was taken as the exemplar for high distinction, which is the highest possible grade for half of my papers. I was the first student to ever receive 100% in one of those papers. And for one of my assignments, the lecturer said that it was a waste to use it as an assignment. So they actually created an entire new method of assessment that will allow me to get the grade by just getting it published somewhere instead. Before I graduated, I was invited back to be a lecturer and I did all of this online through remote learning. In fact, the first time I visited the actual campus was to run a workshop for the upcoming masters and PhD students. I now continue to guest lecture at Monash University, teaching learning skills, working with the masters and PhD students in education. And Monash University has recently agreed to be our formal research partner for I Can Study, which is my company that teaches all of these skills to measure these methods and publish on their success. And I did all of this in about 15% of the recommended time or how long other people were studying. In fact, if you look at just the amount of time I spent studying and taking away all the time on just literally writing essays and assignments, I probably only spent about 40 hours across the entire year year of proper reading and studying. And without these four ways, I would not have been able to do that. Now a disclaimer, these four things, they will work for basically any subject that you want to use this for, basically any curriculum, any structure. However, they do require you to have a certain number of skills in place. Now obviously I had these skills, but if you struggle with these steps, then you can train yourself to reach them. Start with a simpler version, tone them down, but aim to reach this eventually. And I promise you, you're all capable of reaching this level with a little bit of practice over time. I can say that with confidence because training these skills is actually what I do for a living. So let's get started with number one. Now, the first thing is to aim high. And this seems like obvious advice, but you really have nothing to lose from aiming higher than you think you're capable of achieving. On top of actually setting higher goals and pushing yourself to try a little bit harder, it also makes you think fundamentally differently. There used to be these really popular bracelets, and I don't know if they're still popular anymore, but it used to say WWJD, and it stood for what would Jesus do? It was really, really popular because it was a way for people to think like, oh, what would the characteristics and attributes of, in this case, Jesus, be in my situation. And I think this is a really good reframing technique because it's very difficult for us to think about what we should do from our perspective. And it can be easier to think, what would someone else do that was able to achieve this? So when we aim high, we can think about what type of behaviors, actions, characteristics, someone that could achieve at that level would do, and then we can try to copy them. And thinking about it in this way can help us study smarter rather than just harder. It makes us evaluate our own bad habits and catch ourselves on things that we might be doing purely because we have been used to doing them and we've been doing them for years and years, even though in the back of our mind, we really know it's not going to be helpful for us because we know that a truly elite student probably isn't doing that. It's gonna make us look for alternatives. And you know, they always say, shoot for the moon and fall on the stars. If you aim high, 
Worst case scenario, you just won't hit that goal, but you're probably gonna do better than you would have anyway. By the way, I've never really understood that saying because the moon is significantly closer than all the stars that we see in the sky. Step two is a simple one. It is to cram. Yes, cram, but cram early. I made sure at the beginning of every semester to put aside two weeks where I was gonna go through all the content for all the papers as much as I could. Now, I didn't have all the resources available. I didn't have all the lecture materials. They weren't released in advance. I had lecture objectives to work with. I knew the textbook that they were going to use and I knew the general gist of what was going to be covered. So I let myself use that as a guiding stone to get as much pre-study done as possible. And cramming is effective in a lot of ways. It puts our brain in a set of urgency and it makes us work through the material faster. And because we're covering more topics in a single session, it means that we're able to find connections and relationships between those concepts that we might have otherwise missed if they were presented to us week by week in isolated silos. However, cramming is often done poorly because we do it all the way at the very end when the assignment or the exam is due and that puts unnecessary stress and pressure on us. If we simply just do the exact same process, but we do it at the beginning, it means that now we've got more free time, more flexibility, and we can either enjoy life and do other things. For me, I was still working full time. You know, this has happened over the last year and a half, basically. So all the stuff that I've been doing that you've been seeing on my YouTube, I was doing all of that concurrently while studying for my Master of Education. So for me, it was really, really important to save as much time as possible. I know that some of you watching, you've got young family, you've got kids, you've got a mortgage to pay, you've got a job that you're working full time while also trying to study full time. And the trick is going to be about making sure you can clean out and save some of those days by doing your cramming as early as possible. When you're working ahead, doing that early cramming, you have to do it the right way. Let me explain. There's a few things that we need to think about here. If this line is a timeline of learning, here yeah, I'll write time, then different types of information are more useful for our brain depending on what stage of learning we're at. So in the earlier stages, our brain is craving more structure. It doesn't do well with lots of fine details. It doesn't do well with all those facts and figures and statistics and definitions. What it wants to know is how to think about the topic compared to the later stages where then it's going to be a lot better to take in all of those details because those details now become more relevant. And this is just all about connections. And this is what research on human cognitive architecture tells us. At the beginning, our brain has a prior set of knowledge and connections and networks, which allow it to make sense of information. Now, if a new piece of information comes in and we cannot see how they might be connected to what we already know, then it becomes very difficult to make it relevant, which means that our brain doesn't see what the point is of holding on to it, which is why we would very quickly forget it. And this is the reason why a lot of the time you'll be studying and studying and studying, and then a week later, you've forgotten half or more of what you've learned because when you learned it, it wasn't relevant. And so the trick to effective learning. Basically, all the principles of efficient learning are, are about getting your brain to not prune and get rid of information that it thinks is not worth keeping. And the way we do that is to, in a way, trick the brain into thinking that it's worth keeping. And the way we do that is through creating connections and relationships. So at the very, very beginning, when you're first learning about a subject, what we wanna do is we wanna find those key pieces of information throughout the entire text of what we're learning that we know are slightly more relevant and familiar compared to the knowledge that we already have. And this allows us to create what I often call anchor points of relevance. That means that when we get new information coming in after that, we now know how it's connected because we've got more points to connect it with. And then as we continue to learn more, we can connect it to more and more points. So. In a way, what we're saying is that the easiest way to learn something new is to have prior knowledge on it already. We can't always have prior knowledge in everything. So what we do is that we build prior knowledge, which I know sounds impossible. And I guess technically, if you really get into definitions, it is impossible, but hopefully you get the gist. It's about taking the level you're at now and then learning just enough to take you to the next level, which allows the next level to be more relevant and the next level to be more relevant so that eventually you can cover all of the content down to the finest detail, but each step 
feels relevant because you're building on the knowledge of the previous step. And it often means that you have to go out of order, skipping huge amounts of material as you go on your first passes through the material. There is a time to learn everything and knowing when is the right time is something that makes a enormous difference. If you spend all of your time at the early stages committing to details and definitions and trying to memorize everything, then there's no point because a few weeks later, you're gonna have forgotten it anyway. You're still not gonna know how to think about it. You're still not gonna know how it's all related together because you haven't been able to consolidate it. A lot of people say that you should go and memorize things first and then consolidate it afterwards but that doesn't actually make sense. You cannot learn it first and consolidate it afterwards, at least not efficiently, because by the time you come to consolidating it, you've already forgotten a lot of it. That's how good and efficient your brain is at forgetting information. That's why the most efficient way is to make sure that we're consolidating it at the time we are learning it. In fact, some fascinating neuroscience research has shown that the quality of your memory later in the future can be predicted, at least partially, by the type of activity your brain underwent at the first time it learned it, which means that how we think about information now when we first consume it dictates how well we're going to know that information later, which is also kind of logical if you think about it. So ignore those details at the beginning. When I was going through, and if you watch my other videos, when I'm actually studying it, you'll see that I'm putting this in practice. I'm getting a big picture understanding. And then each iteration, I'm just building the complexity and depth and detail of that information. And if I run out of time, that's fine because I've gotten the most important stuff done first. And if I really need to cram in those details, I can do that a week or two before the exam. Just chuck it into that short-term memory, cram the details in, and even if I forget it, a couple weeks later, it's all good because I wouldn't even need it a couple weeks later. So it's about being strategic with what information you learn at what stage of your learning process. And this is crucial for effective learning. If you don't follow these principles, I don't think it's realistic to do well at least at a higher level, especially you know, for those of you that are in university or those of you that are in high school that are struggling with this, this is gonna flip your world upside down. So how do we actually do this? Well, you can look at my other video to see some of the techniques that I use in terms of non-linear mapping and how I arrange those concepts. It's quite a bit to go through. That video is gonna do it more justice than I can right now. Literally because I have to check out of this Airbnb. In like 20 minutes, <laughs> I need to wrap this video up. And by the way, here's a very interesting thing is that we actually intuitively already know that there is a time and place to learn different types of information. So for example, if you were learning biology for the very, very first time in your life, you wouldn't say that the most efficient way to learn that is to go and read through 2000 PhD theses to try to figure out, you know, basic elementary biology. It'd just be way overkill. It'd just go over your head. You know, for example, if you want to learn about learning science, the most efficient way to learn about learning science is not to spend years of your life going through primary research on learning science to create a system. The most efficient way to learn it would actually be to join, let's say, a program created by someone that did spend all that time to do that and did all the trial and error for you and then packaged it in a very, very nice consumable way for someone like yourself. So we know that some information is gonna go over our heads if it's too advanced, but the trick is realizing that that happens at a micro level too, even in a single lecture, even in a single chapter, even in a single paragraph, some information is simply not suited for our brain at that time, and it's better to pick the path of most relevance. You will be able to cover all the information. You're not gonna miss anything, it just means that you're gonna go through it multiple times, picking up different things as you go. And now the fourth point, and this is actually more of a pro tip, but it is to be very resourceful and strategic with the way that you use your resources. And the biggest resource that you have often in a university setting is the staff, the lecturers. Now, the way that I've seen most people use lecturers is it's kind of like a waste of time because the questions that are being asked the lecturers are the ones that are very, very basic surface level. They're just saying, I don't understand this. Can you explain it to me? You know, what is the meaning of this particular thing? You said this in the lecture, what does that mean? You really should be aiming to have self-regulated learning skills to the point where you don't need help with those simple level questions. These are the types of problems that you need to have the skill to be able to figure out yourself. Like you shouldn't really have to ask someone else for low level information like that. You can either look it up yourself and learn the skills of looking things up or learn the process of self-explanation and generation. Now, this is obviously for a more mature set of learners. Like if you are 
listening to this right now and you're like 11, 12 years old, yeah, asking your teachers about things is gonna be really important part of your learning strategy. But even then, we should be aiming to get to a point where we don't really need to be asking for very simple information. It's a core skill that's going to transfer through for the rest of your life. The way that I like to use questions is to test hypotheses or check things that I have synthesized together that is almost impossible to really figure it out for myself. So for example, for one of my papers, we were introduced to like 13 different models for adopting new innovations and new innovative educational frameworks and technologies. And all 13 frameworks, we were meant to kind of learn them and see some of the trends and the similarities. And as I was going through them, I wanted to synthesize a comprehensive framework that looked at all the different angles that the other frameworks did. So I went through and found the trends and similarities and compared and contrasted and I spent about you know probably a solid hour and a half just going through back and forth with these models to create my version of a model that I thought abided by all the considerations of the other models padded up for the weaknesses of some of the models and enhanced some of the strengths of the other models and at the end of that I had this singular kind of fairly comprehensive multifaceted model that made sense for me it's really important that it's for me, because I'm the one that put in the cognitive effort to make it make sense, and therefore that's why it's gonna be beneficial for learning. If someone else were to just simply look at it, they're not gonna get you know, that enlightenment that I did because they didn't put in the work to try and understand it. They're not receiving the learning because they didn't do the thinking. I did the thinking, therefore I'm getting the learning out of it. Now, for me to check if that model is accurate would probably take, I mean, that's probably honestly like a whole PhD's worth of work to do that. Like that information is probably does not even exist anywhere because I synthesized it. It's sort of new. And that's what I use the lecture time for. I got a meeting with the lecturer and I said, hey, I've been looking through all this stuff. I created a model that I think for me makes a lot of sense. Can I run you through it? And can you let me know if I'm missing something, if there are any red flags, if I completely misunderstood some perspectives of it. And I ran through the thing and they said, it looks really good. And in fact, they invited me back to present it to the rest of the class to show as an example for other people what they should be doing when they're going through the readings. So. That's an example where someone with years and years of experience can look at it and say, yep, that makes sense in a 15, 20 minute conversation, whereas it would have taken me 15 to 20 months of my own work to try to verify it. Now that's a strategic use of lecturer expertise time. And this is the same case for when you're working with supervisors or mentors in the workplace as well. Try to develop the skills to figure out all the basic stuff by yourself. Use expertise for where expertise is needed. And in least of all, it's going to give your markers and supervisors a favorable impression because those types of questions are the ones that show them that you are really a high level thinker. Which brings us to the final point, which is the one thing I didn't do that I see a lot of students doing all of the time where if I had done that, all four of the things that I've just told you about would have been made redundant. It wouldn't have had any real impact. And that is that I did not compromise on the non-negotiables. What does that mean? That sounds really confusing. And actually the statement is confusing. Let me explain. At the beginning of the paper, I was part of a WhatsApp group with all the other students. And I very quickly realized that some of the students were really struggling with the workload. They were studying a lot of hours and they were not really getting a lot of reward out of it. They were struggling to understand the concepts. The assignments were really stressing them out. At that point, I essentially already finished the entire semester's worth of material. And the students asked me for advice on what they should do. And I told them some of the things that I've just told you right now. For example, you know, make sure to cram early, try to study ahead, finish through the semester. And one of the things that was very common for them to fire back with was, but we don't know what's going to be covered. The lectures haven't been released yet. We don't have enough. All we have to work with is this textbook. We don't know what parts are gonna be relevant. All we have is that. We know what the assignments are gonna be about and we have a very general lecture outline, but we don't know what the material is. There's no slides for it yet. I can't do it. I can't study that way, Justin. But the thing is I did. And that's the difference is I know that in order for me to make things work, in order for me to work full-time or beyond full-time hours while studying for my master of education, which is 
a full-time program and to do well and to do it in only 15% of the time. I knew to achieve my goal, I needed to do that. I needed to cram everything in early. So for me, I wanted to find the solution. So I used what I could. I made do with the resources I had available. I used Google and Wikipedia and, and the textbooks and the recommended readings and whatever it is. And I tried to figure it out. I made an educated guess on what I think is likely to be covered even though the lecture slides aren't there, I said, well, look, I'm probably gonna get at least 70% close and the 30% I'm missing, I can pick that up during the lectures, but at least I've got that head start. It's better than nothing. And so I had that kind of solutions mentality. I wasn't looking for reasons why I couldn't follow these rules. I was looking for the path that allowed me to follow the rules because I knew that they were non-negotiables. I had to do that if I was going to succeed at this task and very, very, very often when I'm working with students and they come to me with their concerns about things and I ask them about what they're doing with their methods and the techniques. And a lot of time I've already taught them techniques and I've already taught them the methods, but they say, oh, I can't do it because of this reason. My commute is too long. I'm spending too much, you know, I'm not able to focus at home. I fall asleep in the library. I, you know, procrastinate too much. Whatever other excuse there is, they're looking for a reason why they cannot do it. And so I ask the question, are you really wanting help why are you just wanting validation for why it's hard for you and the light just turned off i need to check out of my airbnb in like five minutes i haven't packed yet that's probably a good segue i'll leave you with that thought and catch you next time